decided it wants me to give subtitles a try. OK, so this is actually, um, I, I sort of retired last summer from Amazon, and you saw this ride off into the sunset. This is this view of the sunset from my house. So I thought that would be a good start. Um, and I'm going to go through a bunch of things. But first of all, I'm going to go with this. This is a picture of me in 1982 at the gig that you just heard. I was playing bass, and this was all at Bedford City Hall in England. And, you know, like a classic rock band on their f one of their many farewell tours that you tend to see coming by, you, don't, you want to hear the hits, right? You probably don't want to hear that new single they just wrote. <laughs> and, then, and you have no idea what the last five albums they released are called. But you want to hear the old stuff. Um, so I'm going to fit in a few other things. But anyway, so I'm sort of theming this in, in this way. All right, so I have a set list. Uh, that was Black Tiger, Don't Look Back, and of course, I am looking back. That's the point of this talk, so it seems sort of inappropriate somehow. I'm going to talk about Netflix, microservices, some Cloud Trend stuff, a some stuff I did for GopherCon, a developer conference. I've got code in here and some weird non-idiomatic um, non Go programming. Um, some Lego spaceships and kitchen sink animations that I did at AWS. And then the track you didn't want to hear, which is about sustainability. Um, I was going to do a workshop on sustainability at this conference, but nobody signed up for it, so I'm just going to do it as a, you get a chunk of it anyway. <laughs> and, and then something that is, I'm working on, which is, is sort of half-formed called Petalith, that I'll explain later. And if we finish in time, there is an encore. If, if, uh, if, you know, if I get the right amount of applause at the end, you get the encore, <laughs> which was done at GoTo Aarhus 2013. It's bottleneck analysis with the, the, all the examples based on how to feed booze to conference attendees, which is exactly what happens next. And we did ask if we could get booze brought in for you at the end, and apparently there's some health and safety issue. So sorry. <laughs> all right. OK. So. The talk features singles from these albums, because these are all like 30 to 40 minute talks, so that's sort of an album. So what I've got is sort of five minute kind of chunks out of each of these talks, and I've picked the sort of bits that I thought were interesting that people overlooked, that we sort of, I keep talking to people about, well, we, we did that Netflix 10 years ago, was sort of one of my re recurring thing. Um, and these are, these are the various talks. I did post these slides to GitHub, because that's where I put my slides. So we're going to go on Netflix now. And, if we mute, my, mute the microphone briefly. We're going to... Oh. All right. Okay. Take yourself back to November 2010 in San Francisco. Um, I turned up. No one had heard of Netflix. Netflix was just not a known technology company. A guy called Randy Shute, who I'm actually competing with right now, invited me to do the talk at that conference. Um, and um, he did a track called Architectures You Always Wondered About. Um, so what did we do here? This is, this is the story. We stopped building our, our, own, our own data centers because we were, everything was going too fast. We decided to use AWS. Um, we were finding we could hire people that knew how to do it. There's this whole undifferentiated heavy, undifferentiated heavy lifting thing that one of Vogels was going on about. So we decided, well, let Amazon build a, a thing. Now, you have to realize, at this point, when we started doing this, the only way you could buy AWS was on a credit card. That They had no sales force. They had to create a salesperson to talk to us. And they had to create the enterprise license. Because we needed one, we weren't going to run Netflix on a credit card on AWS, and there's like, it's, I don't know how many hundreds of millions of dollars a year they spend now, but it, was not, it does not fit on a credit card. All right, so what, why, and how? So what we were trying to do, I'll talk about the goals we had, some anti-patterns, and then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that I probably don't get through in, in this version. But these are the goals, and this, if you look at this set of goals, pretty much any trend, yeah, this is a good set of goals. So you could print these out, take them to work, and say this is our goals for our transition, because this is just the right stuff to have in your set of goals, right? You want to be faster, more scalable, more available, more productive. And that was what we set out to do. And that was sort of guiding light for this whole thing. Lower latency, avoid, need, avoid needing any more data center capacity, 
more robust, more available, leveraging the availability zones. We, the previous version we had in the data center was based on Oracle, and every other week we'd take it down for a while. Sometimes it was much longer than others because everything screwed up. Um, so we didn't want any downtime. We didn't want to have a database schema to change. We wanted to be more agile with a reasonably large team and run screaming away from an eight-year-old architecture, which we've been changing every two weeks and had turned into a big ball of mud kind of thing. So these is, this is the anti-architecture. I've actually got a whole talk on that somewhere. Um, these, I wanted people to stop doing this list of seven different things, right? We want a distributed key value no SQL. We, didn't, we want to stop using sticky in memory sessions move to latency tolerant protocols, untangle our service interfaces, instrument the service pattern, not the code. So what I mean is every microservice we built had the same interface. Everything had to have slash status, slash health check, and all the, inter all the incoming traffic was, was monitored in the same way. It got logged in the same way, and then you stuck your code in the middle of it, but everyone had the same pattern. Um, we went from fat complex objects where you're almost trampolining through it to get all the random data and it tangled everything up to these very lightweight serializable objects. And the developers, instead of developing a jar file and then giving it to someone in QA that would try and mash all of them together every two weeks to put on the train and get released, they took that jar file, wrapped it in a service and released it whenever they felt like it. Right, that, that was the difference. So these really tangled interfaces we had, uh, data center implementation was exposed, we had Oracle SQL queries and the business logic, full sharing. Uh, there's this sort of event, event if, if, if you've probably run into this, there's this thing called the, uh, the, the repo event horizon where you import one thing and you're okay, and you import the other thing you wanted and the entire repo turns up in your build. Right, have you seen that? Like, well, this depends on that, depends on that, and you've just got this little thing. So you can't build a small thing because everything you touch drags everything else in. You cross the event horizon and now you are sucked in and you can't get anything out. So we wanted to fix that. So what we did was do some strict layering, build an interface, and have the interface be the service. Now, this is something that says a little subtle. Most people see a bunch of microservices, and they think the wire protocol is the interface between the services. This wasn't what we were trying to do. The library you imported was the interface, and you got some object interface, whatever you wanted, and that library could run locally. It could talk to a service. I don't care what it did, because my, my code was built against an interface. Right? And so everyone that built a service had to build a library that was used to consume that service. We, I mean, your job was to build the, to supply something against that interface. And so we ended up building this in two layers. And think of this as, say, if you talk to a, let's say you want to do, talk to a disk, right? You want to save something to a file system. You have POSIX semantics, that's your API. You have the file system, which could be, you know, ZFS or whatever, some file system. Under that is a SCSI driver or an NFS driver, and then there's some storage, right? So think of what we're doing here is we're saying the thing that accesses the service is like the device driver, only knows how to talk to NFS, and it's got very limited sideways dependencies, or it only knows how to talk to a SCSI disk. Above that, you've got a file system that knows how to talk to different things and is caching and has a much more complex interface. So we split this interface in the microservice into two layers, right? The sort of device driver layer with only just POJOs and no dependencies. You could import that and you wouldn't drag in the whole world. Or you could do a more higher level thing that was more specifically suited to the thing you were trying to do and express this interface in terms of the business objects you had. Like, give me a movie, give me a genre, give me a customer, were the higher level things. And the lower level things was talk to this Cassandra database and return this POJO that has some stuff in it. Um, so when we were trying to build everything at once, of course, nothing existed, so we had the sort of bootstrap problem. So we built a bunch of fake things. There was an there was a, um, identity interface which knew about the 20 developers that were working on the project. <laughs> like, they were the only customers you could get. You could get any customer you wanted, but as long as they were one of the 20 people that were working on the project, because there wasn't really a database behind it. And we used that to fake the system up, right? So we had um, this, this problem with too many big objects, movie and customer, and everything you touched in the data center modified movie and customer, so you have 100 developers every, trying to merge all their changes to movies and customers. That was the problem, so we got away from that. Wanted to get away from that. 
So what we did was we built this thing we called faceted, and this was sort of like, it's kind of like building, bringing multiple inheritance to Java, which doesn't really have multiple inheritance, but um, the video and visitor objects were just, an, just basically an int. It was a number. And you could turn that number into the thing you needed it to be by doing video as a presentation video if you were a front end and you were trying to figure out how to render bits about it, pictures and things. Or if you were doing personalization on it, you, you rendered it as a merchantable video and you were doing the merchandise, merchandising algorithms. So it basically was this sort of, I don't know, it was a fairly complex piece of code to, to make all this work. But it meant that the things that we were passing around between the services were just lists of integers. You know, array of, int array of integers would be the movie IDs, but there was a nice type, type safe way of doing that. So that was neat. Um, okay, so the response to this talk was incomprehension and confusion. <laughs> Most people thought we were crazy, and literally I got people saying, you'll be back in the data center pretty soon. So that, that was an actual quote I got. So six months later, I did the Oracle, uh, sorry, the uh, Cassandra Summit in San Francisco. And I did another version of this. We've gone on a little bit further. And I really like this slide. Things we don't do, and it was just animated in the old version. Don't have the wrong config. We don't wait. We don't file tickets. We don't ask permission. We don't wait for things. We don't run out of space or power. We don't plan capacity in advance. We don't have meetings with IT. We actually didn't even know who our IT people were anymore because the, the, the AWS budget had been given to development Right? The, the, what used to be the IT people said, you keep those you know, Wi-Fi working in the buildings and ERP systems and personnel stuff, but stop worrying about the product. So all of the, all of the operations of the product was given to the dev teams to run. Okay? So we called this no ops, but then all the ops people got very grumpy with this, so we stopped calling it no ops. Um, and I like this old picture too. Run away! They just ended up blowing up. Um, this is why our data center was blowing up. One year, year on year, 37 times growth. Not 37%, 37 37x, right? And we exceeded the capacity of the data center pretty quickly, somewhere in the middle of that. So that was, that was why we didn't know um, how, we knew we couldn't big data, build data centers fast enough. And then for high availability, we started using Cassandra to replace um, an Oracle, so we stored, our, Cassandra just writes everything in three places in a zone. It, this is actually a picture of, I think one of these is probably an Amazon building. The zone, the buildings aren't actually that close together. They're, they're sort of across town from each other. They're not on the same power grids and things. But when you write data in Cassandra, it puts it in three disks or in th three machines in three different buildings that are like 10 kilometers apart or something like that. And then I'm very proud of this next slide. I had to bring it in because it has the correct map of the world um, for the locals. And anyhow, either Hawaii or Australia should be in the middle of this, so I think that's about right. That's the places you need to be able to get to. Um, and I just said, well, you know, and it also does this remote stuff where you can make copies remotely, and Cassandra knows how to do that too. So that was all cool. Um, and then there was, how do you archive? Well, Cassandra has this nice thing that it writes immutable stuff to disk. It's an immutable log writer. It just keeps appending stuff to a thing called an SS table, a sorted string table. So what it has is in memory, it builds this table, and every now and again, it just takes this hash table and stuffs it to disk as a sorted string table, and eventually it merges them and deletes the old ones and stuff like that. So what we had to do to do backup was take copies of these things. Whenever you saw it being written to disk, we would copy it to S3, so we were just compressing it. So we compressed it and encrypted it and stored it in a different region, and then stored it in a different cloud provider, <laughs> just in case S3 suddenly decided to lose everything. Because we didn't, because the old way was like somebody from Iron Mountain would turn up and take tapes out of your disk drive and drive away in a little van. And we didn't have that anymore. I didn't want to have to tell Reed Hastings, sorry, we lost all of Netflix one day because S3 decided to get un unhappy. Um, so, Chaos Monkey. This was one of the first times we started talking about Chaos Monkey. And the real thing about Chaos Monkey was we had autoscalers that we wanted to scale down. Scaling down means you have to stop running some instances, and you don't want to have to go in and drain the traffic and do all some contract. Just turn the thing off, just kill it, shoot it in the head, fine. That's exactly the same. So we had to build everything that had no, no local state on disk, right? So that, all this is is an architectural design control that lets you scale down. That was really, I mean, and, and you know, every now and again it would kill something, and the autoscale would put it back for you. That was basically it. 
All right. So the response to this was Netflix was a unicorn. It might work for us. It wasn't relevant to anyone else. They, they agreed at this point. There were some outages on AWS where Netflix stayed up, and Reddit went down, and Jeremy Edberg, who worked for Reddit, was watching Netflix. On this, the, on, you know, there was a zone that went down, basically, and Reddit went down, and Netflix was running on the two remaining zones. All right. So um, we're a unicorn. So can you cut the microphone again? It's time for it to There we go. This is the Cloudicorn. Somebody made me a t-shirt. And this was my, for many years, was my Twitter icon because they said we were unicorns. So, all right. So um, I came to my Yao for the first time, I think, in 2013. That was like a month or so before I left Netflix. And I did a full day workshop with Ben Christensen. And there's like a 300 slide deck somewhere you can go find in the history and whatever. Um, and then I started running around with Battery Ventures talking to people about cloud and microservices and containers and stuff. But one of the things I did was um, this talk on state of the cloud. And I did it at GigaOM's structure conference. I did it at a few other places. So this was sort of a rerun where I was looking at, at it. But that, I like this thing. This is a, a, a graph that Simon Wardley put together for like, well, Netflix started doing something and enterprise you know, ignores it. Then the rest of the world starts doing, they start saying, no, 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 I said no. And then they say, oh, no. And then they say, oh, crap. And then they do it. Right? And I was sort of somewhere in this rest of the world to enterprise IT. Enterprise IT in 2013, 2014 was just going in the oh, crap moment where they said, maybe we do have to do cloud after all. Right? Um, and there's some nice, Lydia Leong in 2014 said, like, everyone's using AWS. Um, and then in 2015, she said, the banks are using AWS. And um, Rob Alexander on stage said, we can operate more securely on AWS we can in our own data center. And he said that on stage, so I tweeted it, and she retweeted it, and yay. All right, so that was cool. Um, so the enterprise vendors. We're a bit kind of grumpy about this, but so this is how this is their response to cloud. So this was Dell. The ship's sinking. Let's rebrand as a submarine. They actually were taking themselves private, right? That was like metaphorically, you're becoming a submarine, right? And then EMC decided to merge with them. Let's merge with a submarine, <laughs> right? And if anyone remembers that time, HP were breaking themselves into two. <laughs> And the only thing they could talk about was how effectively they were taking the breaking themselves into two. And these, that sequence of slides, uh, um, Barb Darrow, who's a journalist, says she almost wet herself laughing in the front row. So that was cool. Um, and some other people remembered these slides from other places I used them. So that was, it crystallized what the, what the actual response was. So they won't let me do things like that anymore when I joined AWS. But anyway. Um, all right, so microservices. So I think it was the MicroExchange Berlin. I think it was. February 2013 or 2014 or something like that. And then James did the, the, the wiki post, the, the, the blog post, and um, Fred George, who I'm also competing with. Thank you for not going to see Fred. Thank you. He was the one who actually came up with the term. The wheel. I was calling it um, something else at the time. And we all decided. We got together in Berlin and said, we're all going to call this microservices. We all watched each other's talks. We all said, OK, we can all align around this. Sam will write the book. James will write the blog post. I'll tell, it, I'll tell everyone this is what Netflix is doing. And Fred would go and do his thing. And sort of four or five of us got together. And about a year later, everyone started talking about microservices. And I remember some press, something in the Wall Street Journal, a CEO was recorded, reported as telling their, his CIO that they had to do microservices. It's like, what? <laughs> OK, so we've won, or whatever. We, whatever we've won, anyway. Um, so this is actually an excerpt from so the end of 2016. I just gathered all my microservices stuff into one huge deck. And you can go find it. There's a 350-slide, basically, workshop of all the stuff I have. So I'm just going to summarize a few bits of it. But this is kind of the se this is one interesting thing. Remember I told you in 2009, they said we were crazy. This, we can't even believe you're doing this. 2010, they said it wouldn't work. 2011, it only works for unicorns. 2012, OK, we'd like to do that. We can't figure out how. 
in 2013, I'd released a whole bunch of open source code, and they were sort of, at least some people were trying to use the open source code. Not necessarily that successfully in the end, but because it turns out you actually had to have the Netflix culture and engineering way of working as well as the code to make it work. But, you know, at least they tried. So this is some of what I learned. Speed wins in the marketplace. This was the problem. Netflix was tiny at the time. We had a huge number of competitors that wanted to take us out. Comcast, Apple, Amazon, um, most of the other, yeah, HBO, they all, they all wanted to take us out. In fact, they all wanted to buy us, but they thought that if they bought, well, I think Apple probably didn't want to buy us, and Amazon kind of didn't really want to buy us. But if somebody else bought us, they'd feel compelled to bid. And so Comcast, I think, wanted to buy us, but if they did, we'd end up working for Apple, which would be even worse. So, you know, they, they, so there was this sort of circular standoff thing, like I call it a Mexican standoff, and we just had to grow as fast as we possibly could, so it ended up being too big for them to buy us. And that's actually what happened, so that was a cool strategy. Um, it's the sort of business level stuff we got from talking to Reed Hastings occasionally. Um, we were removing friction from product development. This is high trust, low process, no handoffs between teams, all API driven. This freedom responsibility culture, no undifferentiated heavy lifting. Simple patterns, lots of tooling. And this idea that sole service cloud made impossible things instant. At one point I went, we need to run a cross country Cassandra cluster with, uh, to try something out, to see if we can really push an enormous amount of write intensive data across the country. And I, we wandered out of a meeting where there were uh, some people were arguing it wouldn't work. And we wandered to somebody's cube and said, could you set that up? So, yeah, we got some same machines, got it going, fired some machines up, and beat the crap out of the machine the next day. And we, uh, okay, went to the meeting the following week. Okay, we've got all the data. If you go to a meeting with an argument, you might lose. If you go with data running code, you win. Right? So we just run these experiments at the drop of a hat, really large scale, shut it down really quickly. It's amazing. And, and people would ask me, is it faster in the cloud or the data center? I don't have patience to create something in the data center to find out at this point. It's just that sounds like far too much work. I'm, you know, forget it. Um, so this is kind of one of the sort of ideas that, that about why microservices. So monolithic application, you have everything in one place. And you typically have some like payments or personal data, and you have a bunch of personalization and whatever the app is supposed to be doing, all in one code base. Now, because it's got, say, credit cards in it, the entire release process is subject to PCI compliance, and your security people looking over, and you have to do it slowly, and maybe you're a bank or something, so it all has to be slow. So your user interface experience is crap. Right. So if you split it up into microservices, now you can have a team that's going slowly and has all the controls and is being careful, and, they, it, and it doesn't change that fast. They can be slow at messing with the PCI compliant bits. And then another team can rapidly iterate on making it easy to use and nice and change the color in something in, you know, in 10 minutes instead of having to go through the entire release process of, you know, with all the PCI compliant stuff. Right? So this is one of the reasons to segregate out. The other, uh, oh, yeah, so I'll get this thing. The other thing was this um, OODA loop, right? Observe, orient, decide, act. Some, there have been talks about OODA loops. I'm sure you've heard about them. So this was my version of the OODA loop. So you start by finding a land grab opportunity or you're responding to a competitor or you've noticed a customer pain point. So you've observed something you should try and do. Then you need to do some analysis. Maybe so this is your big data piece. Like you've, you've figured out an innovation, now you need to use big data to model a hypothesis, figure out what you want to do, so you're orienting yourself, and then you plan a response, you just effing do it, <laughs> that's what JFDI stands for, and then um, share the plans with people, but you're telling people what you're doing, you're not asking permission, right? You're, everyone knows what everyone else is doing is the way to look at it. Ask permission is to seek denial, is a quote from, um, but, uh, Scott McNeely had at Sun, which annoyed every manager at Sun for a long time. Anyway, um, and these arrows go back and forth. So you don't just go around the loop in one way. You sort of jiggle back and forth until you've figured out what you need to do. And then you act by just incrementally and automatically launching an A-B test. You're doing hypothesis testing. You think this is going to be better. So you do the minimum possible thing that will answer that question as fast as you possibly can. Right? And then you measure the customers to see if it works, and you go around again and you try other stuff. Pretty much everything Netflix has ever done was done in this method, right? This hypothesis-driven development. So let's say, let's look at this sort of uh, monolith again. 
We've got a release plan, we've got a bunch of developers, uh, we release it, we try it out, and this works well with a small number of, of, of developers. Right. The problem is, if one developer puts in one bug, you block the whole release, and the work of everybody is blocked waiting for you to fix that release and get, get it done again, right? So you've got this blocking problem, this sort of head of line blocking. If you get anything at all is wrong, it stops the work of everybody. So that's the problem. As the, as the number of developers increases, it becomes more of a problem. So this is sort of the alternative. Now, every team has a release plan. They've got a bunch of developers using different languages. They're all deploying asynchronously, and if someone has a bug, it doesn't block anyone else, they just redeploy that one piece again, right? So this is the other reason for microservices, was to just to break apart this release cadence and the blocking problems. The other thing we did at Netflix, and we used, Ops, you can use OpsGenie or PagerDuty, put everyone in a call tree. Right? Not, just the develop, not just the Ops people, the developers were on call, and their managers were on call, and the directors were on call, and the VPs on call, all the way up to the executives. Because if the site's down, you need to call the executives. And in fact, the marketing PR people were in there too because you've got to manage talking. You're on TV because you're down or something, you know, that kind of thing. But then it's like if you get a call at the middle of the night and you don't pick it up, your manager gets it. And if they don't pick it up, it works its way up. So it becomes a career-limiting move to not pay attention to the calls when they come in. right? So that's, that was one way of looking at this. And it just meant everyone was trying to sort this out. The site reliability team um, was basically in charge of calling the right person to fix it. They didn't fix stuff themselves. It's a bit different to the Google SRE model. Netflix, the development teams owned everything. They owned everything all the way through. They never gave up ownership and passed it to a central team. And that meant that they were very incented to shut stuff down that got boring and clean things up rather than parking it somewhere else, right? So it's a different model. Um, but the site reliability team was in charge of generating the availability metrics and then calling the right people and building stuff to figure out what might be breaking next. All right, so we did non-destructive production updates. We threw things out, A-B tests, feature flags, kind of the launch darkly kind of stuff. But what happened was the cost and size and risk of change reduced and the rate of change increased. And this was really what we were trying to drive. These changes, by doing immutable updates, lots of versions of things in production, like, that means that I can always introduce a new version because the old one's still there. I didn't destroy it to create the new one. I'm incrementally adding, and the old one's still there, and I can send the traffic back and forth. If it doesn't work, I switch the traffic back, and I can try a little bit of traffic. So you're doing these kinds of ways of operating. All right, so um, it's what you know that ain't so. There's an old thing, you know, it's the, it's the things that make it harder, the things that you know that aren't true. So you should make your assumptions explicit, extrapolate trends, listening to people who aren't your customers. Netflix optimizes for people who have never seen Netflix before. It doesn't optimize for the busy, for the power users of Netflix, complain bitterly that Netflix is not working well for them, but they've got all the movies and they already understand how to use it. Netflix was kept at this point deliberately simple for people that had never seen it before. So we are optimizing the product for people who weren't our customers yet. Right? It's, a very, it's a subtle distinction, but a lot of people optimize for their power users and you end up building something like Word, which has got a bazillion options that no one knows how to use, right? that kind of thing. Okay, got to get through these slides. All right, my definition of microservices was loosely coupled service-oriented architecture with bounded contexts. And so if you have to release everything at the same time, you're not loosely coupled. And if you have to know too much about the things around you, you don't have a boundary. And I pointed at domain-driven design. And one time I had to, like, there, Eric Evans sitting in the front row and I got to this slide, I pointed at him and he waved at everybody and it was cool. All right. Um, and then this was sort of speeding up. So data center snowflakes take a long time, so you've got to buy the machine and install it and all this stuff. And then we got to virtualization and cloud, so you can deploy minutes. And then containers, you're deploying in seconds, and maybe you could only live for minutes or hours. And Lambda is deploying in milliseconds and living for milliseconds to seconds, right? So you just this was sort of pick your platform, get more and more agility as you go to the right. And then um, separating concerns. So we're trying to do this inverse Conway's law where we set up what the, o the organization of the, of the company to own the groups and the back-end stores in the right way. So the other thing was that a, a microservice didn't have to be small. It just had to do one thing. 
The idea was to sort of have one verb or noun or thing it did, right? So that you could you ask how many things per second can it do? Not, well, there's five different things it does, so you have to do a mix of the workload and plan. No, it, if it does one thing, you can say it can do 100 things a second or 1,000 things a second, and it's much easier to, rash, to understand what it's doing in that point. Um, virtually one developer would produce a microservice. Um, in order to go off call, you had to have somebody else that you'd pair programmed enough or, or code reviewed enough with that you could be off call and they could look after you. So people would sort of pair up a little bit. And we deployed in some kind of container, didn't really care what kind. And this is all cattle, not pets. All right, so we had a whole bunch of books for inspiration here. Um, Irresistible APIs is a really nice one that most people don't know about. I wrote a forward for it. It was um, Kirsten used to work at Netflix. It's a cool one. The rest of these most people should know about. All right. So then you get into all the things that were missing, like what made it complicated. Um, and there's a whole set of topics in here, and I'm just going to pick one of them today. And the one I'm going to pick, because it keeps coming up over and over again, is timeouts and retries. All right. So most people get this wrong because they just set them up wrong and the systems collapse, you get retry storms and say, microservices don't work, they're unfragile, blah, 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 it all falls over. It's like, well, that's because you didn't set up your timeouts, right? So one of the things that people do is when they're setting up, there is like a prototype system and they just copy that and build their microservice and deploy it. And the prototype system has defaults, like say it has a two second timeout with two retries on everything that gets called, right? So now across your entire system end to end, everyone has the same timeout retry policy. I guarantee your system will collapse if you do that. And I'm going to try and explain why it, that happens, right? Because when everything's working, it's all fine. But if a service fails, say that service on the right, the failed service, the one in the middle has now made one, two, three, four, five, six, it's made like eight or 10 calls to that service. It's probably run out of threads. Its CPU is busy and the edge service isn't responding. And there's all this unproductive work going on in the middle, right? Just because one service failed, you start backing up everything through the system. So this is a retry storm. Now let's say you have a partially failed service that's failing occasionally. What you have here is the service in the middle calls it, doesn't get an answer, calls again, gets an answer, tries to respond to the, to, to the thing that called it on the edge, and it says, oh, I've already given up and I'm, I wasn't waiting for that. So there's totally waste of time, do you see? The, the, return, um, the return from the failed service to the overloaded one in the middle uh, came in too late because the, the, the upstream service had the same timeout, so it had already timed out waiting. So you're doing work that is never going to be consumed. This is, this is the important thing to understand, right? You have to, have to uh, what they call, telescope your retries. So you need to have a cascading timeout budget from the edge through to the middle Either if you have a static, fairly simple layered structure, you can do this manually, just set it in, but, or you have to have some kind of dynamic budget or a deadline. Sometimes if you get your clocks all reasonably in sync, you just pass in a deadline. Like if it's past this time, just give up, throw it away, right? This information isn't going to be useful. Particularly have web browser kind of front ends, they have a 30 second timeout at the edge. It's like if that's really, the clock, our clocks are close enough. Like after 25 seconds, give up. Right, you're not going to be doing, they're, they're not going to, they're going to hit the retry button already. So here's, here's a better way of doing it, right? I've got a three second timeout at the edge, I've got a one second timeout and this service in the middle, and if it fails, it tries twice, then it says, nah, that wasn't working, you get an actual response to your request saying this didn't work before you timed it out, right? That's a nice, clean way, there's no extra work being done, you've got one extra timeout in the middle, right? So that's a clean way, and that's because I have three and then this one times two, right? One second twice is two seconds, that's less than three, and I've got time to get it back. I mean, there's a bit of network propagation, but these machines are mostly right next to each other, that's milliseconds, right? So the other thing you want to do is don't ask, you know, if something doesn't work, don't do it again. Like, this is the definition of insanity, doing things over and over again, expecting a different result, right? So if, you, if something times out, don't ask it again. It's probably going to time out again. It's probably doing a garbage collect and it's been gone to the world for 30 seconds or something. Find someone else to ask, right? If I ask you a question, you don't answer, I'll go ask somebody else, right? So there's probably an array of services that do the same thing. So don't retry on the same connection. Retry on a different connection to a different instance. 
and you're very, very likely to succeed. And this is something we built into the Netflix APC stuff. And I don't know why every microservice thing doesn't have this policy built into it, but it works super well. The other thing I haven't got in here is you should only be calling things within your zone if you're on AWS and you're doing availability zones. Don't call cross zones. Only call in zone. Because when a zone goes down, if you're calling cross zones, everything will time out and you'll just collapse. This is one of the things that makes Netflix stay up when a zone goes down. All right, that was that. Time for another t-shirt. Tucked in here. OK. So I went to GopherCon, because to prove that I was really a programmer still and I could write code. So. Uh, and I wrote, I wrote this thing. I called it Communicating Sequential Go Routines because a long, long time ago there was a paper called Communicating Sequential Processes by Tony Hoare. And so have you ever heard of papers we love? There's a meetups around the world where people go and they get a paper and they talk about it and they just like, they, they just dive into an old paper for computer science. This was basically one of those. And I did this talk actually at a Papers We Love meetup as well after the GopherCon. All right, so here's the CSP paper. And unfortunately, it says, this should not be regarded as suitable for use as a programming language. It's a bit of a bummer, really. <laughs> so we've defined an entire um, way of writing code where you, there is no, there, no one has ever written a compiler for CSP. You have, to stare, you have to write it out, and you have to stare at it and think about it and decide that it's probably correct. And that's the way you write CSP, and it's not particularly useful because it doesn't execute. But it's just, yeah, a very influential paper, but that was kind of a problem. So then it's not a full language. I, I, I skipped a whole bunch of slides. It's hard to read as well. And it, it addresses the communication by talking about process names, which says Erlang is a bit like that. You talk to a process rather than a channel, right? So it's process name oriented. I think that's how Erlang works. So then David May came up with this language called Occam which I was using in the 1980s, before I, a long time ago, because I'm old, um, used name channels and was sort of a re-implementation, but was an actual real language. And this is the smallest language which is adequate for its purpose. However, suggestions for further simplification would be welcome. <laughs> like, if you can think of anything to take out of this language, I'll take it out, which is just a beautiful way of thinking about it. Anyway, so there's this paper. And it was 1983. I learned to program in Occam, wrote a whole bunch of stuff in it for transmuters back in the day. And this is a prime number sieve written in Occam. And I won't go through it in detail, but the structure diagram tries to show you this. So you've got, these are all separate processes. And the first one is sort of spitting numbers in through. And whenever it finds a prime number, it tells the printer, which emits a series of prime numbers. So it's a parallel sieve algorithm. And the different processes are written in different colors to try and make it clearer. But this is, some of you may know Go. So this was comparing Occam and Go. On the left, we have Occam. I have Go on the right, which does the same thing. And you can see that the Occam is a little bit more concise because it's got some nice things in it. All I've got here is two processes, two threads, and one of them is trying to send a number to the other one, right? It's a distributed assignment. In this case, the number one on, on the first process is sent over a channel to the second process. That's all I'm trying to do. In Occam, you declare the channel outside the scope of the parallel block, and every line in the parallel block is, a, is an automatically created as a separate parallel thread. That's it. So you just, you just indent, create 10 lines, you've got 10 threads, you can indent them more if you want more structure, but you know, at that level of indentation, you are creating parallel threads. Do, do it, really simple. And all of them have to complete for it to continue beyond that point, which is why on the right hand we have a weight group and a whole bunch of garbage about deferring, weight G done, bleh, all that garbage on the right hand side about weight groups is built into the language as the default behavior. And then to write to a channel, you just do channel exclamation mark, and to read from a channel, you just do channel question mark, and I don't know why we have these arrows and things in Go, but it would be much nicer if they just used the exclamation mark and question mark. Um, the other things that's not obvious, um, some of you may know Rust. Rust is very picky about ownership and types. Occam is as well. So, for example, X is used by the first process. It cannot be owned by the second process, right? 
So the, uh, the concept of ownership that's in Rust, where things are owned and, and you can't, once the things, things grabbed it, you can't touch it from here, all of that stuff is going on here. In, so it's actually really difficult to get things to compile in OCAM until you get it to, and if you could get it to compile, it's probably going to run. Right? It's, it's like Rust, it's a very picky compiler. All right, so then in 1992, something called PyCalculus came out. And this is actually really interesting. It expresses processes which have changing structure. That's interesting. And a communication between neighbors can carry information which changes that linkage. So now you can create a mesh of communicating machines and you can reason about dynamically mixing up these things. So I said, great, I wrote, so then I wrote something, that, anyway. But, um, so let's look at how this works. Um, um, Simple equations such as, <laughs> whatever that is. Uh, and it's easy to show that. Uh, why, why, look, so assuming x is not free in n, blah, 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 more generally it's easy to, sh this is just garbage. This is I have no clue, I don't think anyone has any clue what the hell is being said in this paper. It's, I say, a triumph of notation over comprehension. Um, just impossible. Luckily, um, Peter Welch, Dick was able to figure this out and built Occam, the Pi calculus, into another version of Occam later on. And he wrote this really nice paper that is sort of goes through all the different philosophies of Occam and Pi calculus. And then there's these mobile types, which I think Rust has as well. So you can, you can declare things to be mobile so you can send them over channels and it knows that it's supposed to be mobile. And like if x equals one and x is mobile, you assign um, that one to y then it's no longer x. That you can no longer dereference x because the value is, is moved, right? The value, you know, x equals one, but it, it, it's, it isn't still there anymore because the one has moved to somewhere else, so it's no longer possible to dereference it. So this is kind of a neat trick. So then um, I wrote a whole bunch of code in Go with this sort of pi calculus thing, and I was, should have been arrested for serial channel abuse or something like that, I don't know. Um, it's, it is definitely not idiomatic Go. And I did this at this conference and I got baffled the whole audience, I think, but I had fun. Um, but I don't have time to go through the whole thing. But the point, if you look at this structure, this type, it's a message, right? And in that message structure is a channel of type message. This is the trick. It's like a linked list has to refer to the link is of type the linked list, right? This is the same thing except with channels. So what this means is I can send you a message, like I could send Peter a message that said, here's Aino's email address. And now he knows how to talk to Aino. That, that it's, I'm passing endpoints around, so I can now dynamically create Go routines where the channels that connect them can be arbitrarily dynamically changed, and you can grow and shrink your network by messing around, because the endpoints, the listeners for all these Go routines, are basically dynamically moved around. And anyway, nobody writes Go code like this. So anyway, I had fun. So I wrote a whole uh, simulator that did this, and if you click on the surge link, it still works. And I haven't touched this code for six years, but you know, you can go look at all this stuff. And it was a pretty it was used for a bunch of things, but one of the things was to um, simulate microservice architectures and create arbitrary large networks that I could then feed to monitoring tools that would then fall over. And if they could cope with a really big network, I could make one that was 10 times bigger and they would fall over. So if you want to create an, a network that is so big that it will crash your vis visualization system, this is a great tool for doing that. Anyway, um, all right. So CSP is too limited, PyCalcula is incomprehensible, um, I thought there were some interesting idioms. You can build a simulator. And then there's this nice quote. I was doing a bunch of stuff in systems thinking. We see the world as complex and chaotic because we use inadequate concepts to explain it. So when you understand something, it's no longer seen as chaotic and complex. And this sort of applies to people saying, microservices are too complex. Well, once you understand them, they're actually less complex than whatever was going on inside that monolith that you had. All right. Then I signed to a new label, and hopefully this is where I get to the last t-shirt, so I better tuck in. All right, turn the mic off. There we go. All right. 
So I might go build one of my AWS t-shirts. I have a very large collection of AWS t-shirts. Anyway, how much more time have I got? All right, yeah, okay, running on a bit. Um, so this, was, this is the kitchen sink, and we want to denormalize the, we've called our, 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 our um, the database schemas were kitchen sinks because we'd thrown so much garbage in there that we could no longer modify it without breaking it, right? So this is kind of the analogy was it's like the, uh, think of the young ones. Remember to see the young ones on TV? It's like the kitchen sink they had in their flat where they all lived. So, I, you know, I just got this, I found somebody that could do animated PowerPoint and it was just lovely. So, anyway, I'll just step through this pretty quickly because I'm running late here. Yeah, a yeah, bunch of stuff. And it's easy to add databases in the cloud, so you just stop adding stuff to your central database and just surround your thing and then untangle it until you've got sensible little nice easy databases. Um, and then I got this one, which was about a bunch of people trying to write some code and they weren't doing very well and a couple of people got annoyed one weekend and decided to go off and write the whole thing in a weekend using serverless. And um, they basically coded through the weekend and built the entire thing. So and then spent the next month persuading everyone else that they had finished writing it and that it worked, and then ended up shipping the whole project, uh, finishing the whole project a week earlier based on two, two days of coding. Um, and there are multiple stories like this around serverless. It's just ridiculously quick to build things. And then I, I wanted to show a monolith, and I wanted to show it splitting up into microservices. And this was like, I don't know how they did this. It's like magic in PowerPoint. Anyway. And, and then you've got all these things, and then half of the bits of your monolith are actually off-the-shelf services that you didn't need to build anyway, so you just hook them up. And what was left of your monolith was your business logic, and that's, that's what glues it together, and then you could split that up into, into functions, and then you could only have the functions run when you're calling them, because that's how Lambda works, kind of, sort of, right? <laughs> anyway, so this was sort of me trying to explain uh, serverless to people with cool graphics, yeah, stuff like that. Um, and then we get to the Lego spaceship. So you wanted a spaceship for Christmas, and you're going to go and make one, and it's going to take you a while because you have to design a prototype and carve it from clay and make some molds and all this kind of junk, right? And you sell the finished toy, and that's how toys work, right? Um, or you can get the rapid way, where you get a bag of blocks, you get some instructions, and then you get the best PowerPoint animation in the history of the world, which is the bricks just fall down and make it. I don't know, I don't know how they did that. <laughs> I just wrote, make a Lego spaceship and sent it to somebody, and they came up with this. And the thing about this, it, it's clunky in the corners, and you know, like, these things don't look quite right. So you've got to adjust your requirements to fit that this is now okay, but, but it's also extensible and you can optimize bits of it by building those weird Lego bricks that look like the space, you know, those cones and whatever, all this kind of stuff. So this was the difference between full custom design and, rep and building blocks and why it is so fast to build things with serverless. You have to adapt your requirements to fit the blocks you've got, but if you do that, you can build something ridiculously quickly. And um, there's a book just came out called The Value Flywheel. Um, by David Anderson, which talks about how Liberty Mutual are building stuff in days that would normally take every, anybody months to do. And it's sort of, the other quote I have is that you can, in the time it takes to figure out what version of Kubernetes you're going to use, you've finished building the whole application in serverless. So there you go. Um, bunch of objections and most of these. Uh, Amazon just fixed startup latency completely, by the way. They just snapshot it. So. Um, we're out of time now, but there's development, sustainability operations. Oh, this is why does sustainability work mat matter? There's all these reasons why sustainability matters. And when I do this talk next, I'm going to have to delete some more slides. I'm going to go through a bit faster on the earlier bits. And there's a whole bunch of stuff about energy and how to deal with that and carbon footprint of data centers. All right, and some more things here. All right. I've got the pedal lift bits. I think I'll have to skip the pedal lift bits for next time. But I have got an encore. So the question is whether we get to the encore.
the encore. I get a pet. I have to delete a whole bunch more slides here. There we go. There will be no time for questions before or after the encore. There we go. All right, let's get this going. There's just drinks outside. That's all right. We wanted to bring the drinks in, but apparently that health and safety thing. It takes a long time for it to load up this. OK. So this is actually another picture of me on stage at a different gig back in a long time ago. All right. So the important thing here, bottleneck analysis. Um, this was written overnight in Aarhus, like after one of the things where this was what we were doing that earlier that night. This is the Great Hall in Aarhus, where, um, yeah, you can probably see I know and a few other people in there. Uh, where are you? OK, I can't see exactly where you are. Oh, yeah, there you are. All right. Um, so and this was in, this was in um, QCon London, and this was the most effective way I'd ever seen of people getting drinks into an audience. They were open bottles of Grosch, which is a decent bottle of beer, and it's already open. And it just there were people dry, walking into the audience, and people just grabbing bottles. And no, we were doing this yesterday as well. So perfect best, best way of doing it. All right. So you do some analysis, you grab some data, and you got some distributions of response times and whatever, and blah blah blah. And then I do this plot, which I call a, it's a Cockroft thingy plot, a headroom plot. So basically, you've got throughput versus response time as a scatter plot. And the way things are supposed to work is when you load them up, they get slower. That's what's supposed to happen, right? So you kind of get this graph where, you know, when you hit your, uh, when, when you max out the utilization, things get slower. So you have this sort of hockey stick shaped plot. And that's the, the way things are supposed to be. So. You plot it, and then you discover that we're, we have a conference in Hawaii where we're serving Mai Tais, and it's, um, you know, it's a bit difficult to get those stupid um, umbrellas to open, and there's only one person that could do it. So, so we had a bit of a problem there because uh, we had a, a bit of lock contention in the system, and we're trying to produce drinks with, with just with a bit. With, yeah. So the lock contention, you actually, instead of getting a hockey stick, you get a linear thing. And, and if I just, you just pr do the scatter plot, say you've got lock contention. They say, where? I, I don't know, but you've got lock contention because that's what the plot says, right? So then you get, okay, that didn't work so well. So the next conference, we're going to do this, but we're also going to give people the option of a tire carved out pineapple because if you go to Hawaii, you can get these. Um, but after you've drunk one, you actually arrange it to look like a Dalek and go inebriate, inebriate. And, this was drunk tweeted um, at some point. Um, so you do both. And you get the plot looks like this now, which is rather surprising because, like, what the hell's going on? So it turns out you built an oscillator. And people are either all of the servers are carving pineapples, and every now and again one of them gets free and serves a ridiculous amount of beer until somebody orders another pineapple and then they get blocked. So this is thread starvation. And what happens is that you're actually oscillating back and forth because you've, you've mixed a fast and a slow request on the same system. And the, the slow requests lose up all your threads and block all the fast requests from happening. So you should partition your systems so you have separate places to run them and, and, unless you like building oscillators. All right. And then we have a horizontally autoscaled system <laughs> called a beer flight. And that, yeah, this is fine. This is throughput, and this is response time, and they both look sort of OK. But if you put them on the scatter plot, you get this sort of shape where you can see the system at the low end. So the left side is when it's scaled right down. And as it gets busier, the response time goes up. And then the system scales up and puts some more capacity in. So you get this sawtooth going up and up and up and up. And then at some point, it becomes overnight, and it gets quieter again. And now you've got excess capacity, so it's super fast, and it sort of trundles all the way back down, turning machines off as it goes. Right? So you see this loop with a sort of a sawtooth on top. So if you do your scatter plot and it looks like that, then you're looking at an order scaler without knowing anything else about the system. All right. So that was my kind of bottleneck analysis thing. If you just this really cool idea that you do scatter plots of response time versus latency and look at the various characteristics of them, and you can see what's going on. All right, so that was, that was it.